In fact, we are experiencing an epochal change. The period of nearly 600 years since the Italian Renaissance and the emergence of the sovereign nation state in which oligarchical forms of government and governments committed to the common good existed side by side is coming to an end. In the new paradigm, a new phase in human evolution is already visible. The closest approximation of this is Xi Jinping's vision of a community of common destiny. The concept that the idea of one humanity is set forth to all nations. The economic equivalent of the New Silk Road in which all sovereign nations work together on the basis of cooperation for mutual benefit. Um, so I want people to step back before I get into specifics and have a, a, a big historical sweep on this. Oligarchical systems of government are of the following type, which tend to flow from one to the other. There's different types, but they all have the same idea which is a rejection of the principle of the, of the common good. There's only the principle of the good of the, of the, of the whoever rules that, that society. First is the laissez-faire idea, or government is solely for maintaining order, not to promote the general welfare. And we are, we have been massively infected with this laissez-faire concept everywhere today and in the last several hundred years through Adam Smith and all these people that, you know, government should stay out of the affairs except for maintaining the law and, 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 and things like that. Any effort by the government to promote the positive development of the, of, of any, uh, of the good is is an anathema, and and and, and, and this, this has been hounded in, and hounded in, and hounded in, and, and pounded in, you know, to the point that it's it's almost people talk say that as almost like like they were uh, reciting you know the Lord's Prayer or something. It's it's that bad, okay? And what we're seeing in the West, especially especially. In the, since the time of FDR, is the, is the takeover of this mentality has led to many of the problems and the disasters that have come from the, the rebuilding of, 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 of North America, especially coming out of the Great Depression. So that's one of um, the aspects. The second is populism. Getting people all riled up with wars and false moral crusades against this and that, and using the, 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 the anger and rage of the population to, uh, to control uh, a process. Again, an enraged beast does not know what's in its interest. The third is fascism. Only a strong ruler, the beast man, can maintain order on behalf of the people in the name of the people for the old market. Because any, any devolution of any allowance for uh, a dialogue or a discussion will create opposition to what the oligarchy intends to, to ram through through a dictator. Okay, and, and this came out of France. This came out of France and was then exported to Italy and, and Germany. The fifth is the divine right of kings in the past to do whatever they want. And power flows from the, the well, the will of the king or emperor. Not as in the Renaissance idea, which is that 
Louis XI, for instance, the king of France, said, said, you know, I, the king, am responsible to the welfare of the people of France. Okay? That was his view. Not the divine right of kings. Six, is the divine right of the theocracies, like the Church of England, headed by today's queen, or by the earlier Catholic Church concepts of ultramontism, where uh, the church determined the legitimacy of any leader. The seventh, and perhaps most pernicious, is the secret government. Okay. Where the decisions and actual governing institutions are secret. And this is what Venice was. Or today's uh, more modern version, the Privy Council of Britain and Canada, and the permanent bureaucracy of, of uh, therein. It's secret. The process by which they make decisions is not available. All of these forms are me mechanisms that the oligarchy has used to avoid the issue of the general welfare. Now I want to quickly reference the, uh, the, the European birth of the concept of the nation state in the Renaissance. The concept of the good and the general welfare is intricately connected to the concept of love and beauty and the caring for your children and the caring for the family and the caring for the community. And that concept of love for the nation is what makes a person willing to sacrifice, if necessary, their life for the future generations. And it's a powerful emotion. It's here, an here. emotion of beauty. Here, here. And that's where this, the wellspring of, nation, of the nation, real nation, real patriotism is. It's not in some jingoistic jerk off you know, thing that you hear, but it's in that emotion that we have to our loved ones, extended to the nation. And when people have those emotions, they are better people, and they work, they, they want to work, they want a future. This quality of love can, is now being extended to the entire human race not just to the nation. It still exists for the nation, but it's being extended to the whole human race. Um, now, I'll give you one anecdote on this, because, because people, people don't understand how the first nation, modern nation, got, got started. There was, in France, uh, an English occupation, and, and the way things were very corrupt. I mean, that society in France in the, in the 1400s, in the Middle Ages, was extremely corrupt. You know, the oligarchs and the lords would change sides all the time, and you had mercenary armies and all of that. And the king of France was playing games. Everybody was playing games. It was all games. And this young teenager by the name of Joan of Arc appeared and offered, through her purity, and her passion, and her virginity, to lead the French army. And she did. No one in history had seen these qualities come together in one moment, where the idea of, of French, and she said, I am French. This is, this is where the nation state got started in the sense of the, of an emotional. I am French. And they, they became, they fought for French. They weren't fighting for a lord. They weren't fighting for this. They weren't fighting for that. And, that, and that's my anecdote on, the, on how, and so it's intricately connected to the pure, the beautiful, and so forth. Now, Oh, I, I missed one of the most important uh, 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 f 
forms of government. I apologize. The fourth is a government of corruption. By corruption, of corruption, by corruption, for corruption. As Walpole famously said, the Prime Minister uh, in the early 1700s, every man hath his price. Okay, so that, that's another form of government. Just corruption, period. <laughs> okay, now, so, in the last week and a half, we've had these incredible developments that are dealing a profound blow to the oligarchy and its conception of man and its forms of government. Now, I'll, I'll go back to the Putin's address based on uh, uh, that, he, that he did. Now, most of the address that he did, or, or a large part of the address he did, was actually a lamentation about, while Russia had tremendously improved, it had not improved enough. And he repeated this in the most recent interview with Megan Kelly. And he's picked this weird woman to continue his, his, his dialogue because she represents the deep state directly. She represents people like Obama and, and uh, John Brennan and so forth. And so he wants to have a dialogue with those people directly. And they're helping her get the questions. So she's getting, he's getting the real nasty questions and he wants to deal with those nasty questions. In, so what he told her, when she asked him, what, what, do you, what do you consider your greatest accomplishment and what do you consider your greatest mistake? And he said, those two things are the same. My greatest accomplishment is that, you know, and he listed the people's living standards have gone up and so forth. And my greatest mistake is they haven't gone up. And he said, we still have this massive income inequality. And we have, we have not had, what he said, he said, we, we have not had the, the macroeconomic stability to be able to carry out the development of Russia in the way that could lift these people out of poverty. That is honesty. Okay? That's being honest. And that's being also humble. You know, Criticizing his own his own failure, not just praising his own success. So that that's a very important part of Putin's speech. Now, in that context, the military aspect is that his intention was not to conquer the world or to launch a first strike on the United States or anything like that. His intention was to defend the people of Russia and perhaps defend allies. So he didn't have to invest in all these massive, t massive boom dollars. He had to merely develop enough technology that could uh, outflank, but for what purpose? Not to conquer, not to have a war winning capability. He does not have a war winning capability, but to essentially defend what? The general welfare of the Russian people. So he was operating on the general welfare <coughs> principle. And in that concept, he did not, Russia did not, did not have the means to spend all of this. And no one expected that they would be able to do this because everyone knows the Russian economy was destroyed after, after the, the, the collapse of, of the Soviet Union. And it's been built back up, but it's not that big. Okay? So, so, but yet he's operating on the principle of general welfare. Now, the second thing is this. And this is very important. This goes back to Lyndon LaRouche. Lyndon LaRouche and the SDI was an attempt to use, was an attempt to solve the military problem by developing the defensive technologies, but at the same time creating a technological revolution. So the second feature of this is that the Russian, the Soviets were working on a lot of science. They got abandoned. 
The U.S. was working on a lot of science too. It got abandoned. Putin went back to those, they went back to that science. Okay. And what's important about these technologies that, that Phil was talking about is that they have incredible civilian applications. So the so the so what Putin laid out in the speech is that we're gonna move Russia in a leapfrog to build to develop the technology and the science, not because we, we want to be first in, in, in the military capability. But the two go together. You want to be, you want to build your economy. You want to Im implement the general welfare for your people. Therefore, that's the only way you can go is to, is to do it in this way. This is LaRouche. This is the, what LaRouche has been saying for 50 years. <coughs> uh, the Chinese are doing the same. That is completely in contrast to the way things have worked in NATO, in the U.S., in Europe. It's a completely different principle based on the general welfare. So the U.S., so in that context, uh, you have essentially a president who, in the U.S. emerged, who appealed to the general welfare in, in a sort of, in a certain way. And he got elected. And And I'll get into that a little bit later uh, on, on the question of Trump. Now, so, so now the second earthquake, and you have to understand this earthquake, is the, the Korean situation. Okay. The Obama Bush administration game was to put tremendous pressure on North Korea and not and, and, and scuttle all the agreements that were made on the Clinton and um, to put North Korea in such a, a threatened position that they were forced to develop the nuclear weapons. They wanted North Korea to develop the nuclear weapons because they wanted to use that as an excuse to organize an anti-China Asia pivot and deploy the ABM systems like they were deploying in Eastern Europe. That was the game. So Obama had a policy called strategic patience, which means we don't talk to North Korea. We threaten North Korea, but we do not talk to North Korea. And so what this does is it creates it creates extreme paranoia in North Korea. And then you have these right-wing governments come in, in South Korea to, to make it worse. After the, you know, they abandoned the sunshine policy that existed in the late 90s and, uh, and so forth. And that was the game. Now, the, what, were they, what, they were, what they were doing was going to Japan and getting Japan to go against China. And they were then using certain uh, things that were pissing off China involving the World War II. And so you had this tension building between Japan and China. You had tension building between J Japan and Russia. At that time, the relationship between Russia and, and China wasn't necessarily that friendly. I mean, it was friendlier than it was when they had a war, a border war, but it wasn't that friendly. And then they were working on Vietnam, and so on and so forth, and South Korea. So you had, you know, the South Koreans still, still resent what the Japanese did to them. You know, so you have all these different, different things that are not working. And finally, the Belt and Road comes in, Russia and China start working together, then Russia starts to organize Japan into the development of Siberia, and so on and so forth, and that whole process starts to change. And then Trump became president. And Trump didn't pursue the policy of Obama. What policy he pursued, nobody's not 100% sure about. <laughs> <laughs> he did not continue the policy of, of, yeah. of, of, of Obama. OK, so, so now, um, so, so, 
Now the media is going to go berserk. The mainstream media is going to go berserk, attacking Trump for appeasing dictators and, and God knows what. And you know he's like there are two pods in the pea, two peas in the pod, and all this stuff. And 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 you can expect that. You can expect that. You know they're both. You know, totalitarian oriented and all that, all of that. Oh, Kim, uh, Kim Young would kill his brother, and we're putting in more sanctions, and you know, half brother, and all this stuff. Like, you know, as if somehow that's that's what reality is. But what's what what's happening is that Kim Young Un is is willing to give up his nuclear program. Now, why is he willing to do that? Because if he can be guaranteed the security. They don't want to be spending all this money in that area. They want to go for economic development. They got a they got a population that needs that needs some economic development. That's what they really need, and they're not going to be able to do that if they have such an uh, uh, an immense investment in their military. So that's the that's the second earthquake. The third earthquake is occurred in Italy, and um. There are four basic parties that are the largest parties. Um, the two major ones uh, were the Democratic Party of Renzi and the Forza Italia of, um, of Berlusconi. And then you had the uh, party of Five Star Party, which was formed by a comedian who had, had a criminal record and couldn't be, um, he couldn't run it, unless he formed it. And that party was led by a 31-year-old. And then there was the, the, the regional party called the League of Nord, which is in the north. And what happened was the Glass-Steagall issue was picked up by elements of the League of Nord and elements of the Five Star Party. And the issue of, Europe, of, the, of, 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 of the problem of possibly leaving the Euro was picked up, the European Union. And the other parties, Represented the bankers, and both both Fuerza Italia and um, the Democratic Party went under twenty percent. They got crushed, and the other two parties came up. Thirty-two percent for the um, the Five Star, and I think seventeen percent for the for the uh, for the for the League of Nord, which is a regional party, and it did well in the North. But in the poorer South, the uh, Five Star Party took, took it down. Now, a lot of the leaders of that party signed a, a, a letter that we organized to, to uh, Donald Trump asking him to adopt a glass steagall in the United States and a, and a, and a bank. So, so this crowd, so now it's Italian, I'm not going to predict anything. Italian politics is not something that is predictable. <laughs> Uh, there's too much going on, so I'm not going to say, but, but the implications is very significant. That the population uh, is responding to this in this way. Now, the fourth major development, uh, which is already coming under attack in many quarters, is there was a conference in Nigeria, in Abuja, Nigeria. And it was a conference on Transaqua. And two of our representatives flew down to Nigeria and were involved in the conference. It included a number of the governments in the region and the Italian government and the two major companies involved. Power China, which is committed to building the, uh, the, the uh, Transaqua, it built the Three Gorges Dam. Okay, so it has a lot of experience. And uh, the Schiller Institute is, is, um, is credited with having brought Power China together with the Italian design company, which had designed the whole thing, um, Benefica. And those two companies were there. And the Italian government announced that they were willing to pay for half of the uh, uh, feasibility study. And Power China is saying they can get this done in less than 12 years. And this would be the largest infrastructure project in human history. And it would bring the water up from the uh, central lakes, I mean from the, <coughs> from the central Congo area, up to Lake Chad, refill Lake Chad. Uh, it would be a large canal, and it would bring water north. It would deal with the, the desertification problem. 
and provide a lot of hydroelectricity, and it would transform, economically transform the entire region, which is dying right now. Lake Chad is dying, and and uh, uh, now already there's two attacks on it. There's the environmental attack, and there is the attack saying, "Well, you want to steal our water from from within the, the you know the, the where the water is going to come from." But that's all. But that's but that's a, that's an earth that's an earth shape. Uh, now the the question of Trump, okay, is this. Is Trump, in his own peculiar way, an embodiment of the spirit of the general welfare, or is he an embodiment of the spirit of the old guy? That's the real issue. That's the fundamental issue. Uh, his imperfections are pretty obvious, but where is his intentions, and what is his what is he what is he being guided by? And that's what the question that people have a hard time answering. But obviously the oligarchy is not happy with him, so, <laughs> so obviously they don't necessarily believe he's an embodiment of their intentions. <laughs> now, I'm going to go through now at the end, this, this is not a very long presentation. I want to open it up for questions. I want to go into two aspects of the British system, or this current imperial system. Um, the first is, deals with creating and controlling the narrative. The second is what I call British morality. British morality. It's very important. Okay, the first is, you establish a control over a narrative about a situation. Okay, you do this in the sciences. You do this in the academic world, you do it with history, you do it in anthropology, you do it in archaeology, you do it in, in, in biology, you do it in, um, you do it in every area of politics. So, in politics, the narrative is left and right. Okay. Communism versus capital. These are big narratives. Okay. In International affairs is geopolitics. That's the narrative. That's the narrative. And you control the narrative. And you 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 don't spend the money that you raise in you don't spend the money that you raise in, in, in creating weapons of mass destruction necessarily. You spend the money in controlling the media, in controlling the the, the, the academic institutions and so on and so forth. That's how you do it. So now and the narrative is set up such that Anyone who decides to challenge a narrative and say, no, the issue is the general welfare, not left and right, not this or that, they stand out from the crowd and you go after them to keep the box in, whether it's the Middle East box, the North Korean box, Whatever the box is, you keep people in that box. The West, East versus West box during the Cold War, you keep people in the box. That's a very cheap way of controlling the world. You don't have to have a conspiracy. You just keep the narrative, you control the narrative involving history. Those aspects that contradict the narrative, you basically suppress. The early works of Alexander Hamilton, you suppress. What Lincoln actually did, you suppress. You lie about FDR, saying he was a Keynesian or whatever. You don't allow, you reinforce history within the narrative that you are establishing. And you pay a lot of money to make sure that it goes that way. And then the people get educated in that narrative, and then they, then they uh, begin to think in that narrative, and then you have essentially a control. And the reason LaRouche was seen as a threat from the very beginning, even with a very few people, was he was challenging the narrative. He was challenging the economic system narrative about how the economy worked. 
He was challenging, and eventually challenging this narrative and that narrative and that narrative. And that's why he was a threat. And Sidney Hook, in 1971, this is early, after a debate with the leading Keynesian economist of that time, Albert Lerner, said LaRouche will never, LaRouche won the debate, but he'll never get another debate. <laughs> he'll never have another debate with anybody. Because you break the narrative. Okay, so that's one aspect of, of a British system. It's cheap. You don't have to, it's a long-term process. You spend a lot of money in the at, at academic sphere, in the, uh, in, the in, in that sphere, but, you, but it, it, it works over a long period of time. The second thing is what I call British morality. Okay. And, and this is like completely ubiquitous. Everywhere you go in the media, this is the way they do it. This is British morality. Oh, Saddam Hussein. He's, he's a dictator. He, he kills his own people. You know, you know, we, moral people, should not allow in our modern world to have such a butcher carry out such, such things to his own people. This is the right to protect. But it's, it's, it's morality. It's not, it's not like we want to conquer. <laughs> it's moral. Why is it moral? Because it is. Because you're not going to, you know, and what it does, this narrative, it disarms people. That's, the, that's why they use it. And so now you're going to hear the same thing about Kim il uh, Kim Jong-un. Kim Jong-un. You're going to see, hear the same thing. Right? It's the same thing. What, you know, why are you having anything to do with this butcher? And this is the more, this is called British morality. You want to build a dam? Well, what about the people you're going to displace? That's British morality. Oops. Yeah, what do you, this is, this is everywhere. In, in everything that you have, it's, it's this morality in the small. They pick out something small. And now they shift the conversation to that. And that is how, this is called, I call it British morality. And this is, this is how it works. And it's working, and it's, most people fall for it. But it's not working now, like it used to. Okay, it's not, it's, it's not working. Like, but this is, this was Tony Blair. You know, this was Samantha Powers. This is, this is, um, uh, this is Christia Friedman, by the way. Um, or Newland. Or, or, or Newland, or whatever. Yeah. This is, you know, and millions of people dead later, and many more millions of refugees later, it's British morality. It's paved the way. Or you Yeah, paved the way for all of this disaster. So, um, now, on the pamphlet, I wanted to say one last thing. Um, yeah, the pamphlet uh, is going to have um, a number of different sections. It's going to have a section on who we are as a, as a society. It's going to have a new paradigm. It's going to have maps, and it's going to go through um, Canada and the financial crisis and what has to be done to deal with that in terms of bank separation, Canada, and how it's going to get the credit to do what it needs to do. And then it's going to have Canada and its infrastructure projects. It's going to have a whole thing on, 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 on fusion. Energy. Energy. And, uh, and the concept that we want to have is we want to have a unified development policy for Canada as a whole in the context of the new paradigm. And we want to present this uh, to, to, to the Canadian population, but especially here in BC. And we want to start the process with the people that we've already built uh, a certain inroad into. 
And the idea is to get a discussion going. The idea is, is to get a dialogue going in the institutions, uh, in, in the institutional layer. Um, and we're, we're, we're putting it all together right now. Uh, it's quite a task. We've basically got a framework. we got a framework and we're putting it all together. It's quite a task because no one's ever done this before. We're breaking new ground. <laughs> we're breaking new ground. So, and, 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 and so, I, I, I didn't speak for very long, but I'll, I'll stop there. And open it up.